Okay, so today I think that I have a quite good news for you and the good news could be that except for the Android lecture we will not uh, uh, give you anything uh, new from a technical point of view so no new content no new something new to learn for this course we you add a lot of uh, things to to remind to to try to test to to develop to design so we for now we just stop here for this new technical content and except for the android part that will give you an overview and a support for the groups that would like to develop an android application for their project so having said that today what i would like to do are three things and the, the lecture will be split in three parts the first part will be let's speak about the available material this is an updated version of the available material list that is available that was available on the website and this is available now on the website in this updated list and this is the first thing so let you know which a uh, quite a good overview of which material for sure we have for this course the second part will be let's try to understand how to use this material in something that i called what can i use for doing something so let's try to have one two five ideas needs and say okay to reply to these needs in a generic project i could use technology a device b software c and so on and the third part the last 15 20 minutes will be uh, free mm? so i will stop speaking and if w someone some of you would like to come here and ask question about component selection um, how to do something for your project i will be here just to provide uh, a consultancy for separate groups and if something particular emerge from this uh, group to me let's say conversation i will put this uh, important element in the what can i use for document hmm? but let's start with uh, available material first of all so some some of these things you should already know and have seen but just to provide you with a complete overview. So, the first thing that we have in the lab, and this is, is not really in this way, in 2018, it was a old photo, but more or less, it's similar. We have a development bench that hosts uh, the Wi-Fi router that will that give you the MEI course network, a Philips U hub, that is this one here, and two Raspberry Pi, one hosting a dedicated hardware for creating and maintaining a Z-Wave network, that is a home automation network, and the other one is empty. It's a dedicated Raspberry connected via Ethernet to the router. To the router that is here this one router only right now the router is connected to the internet it has a public address a polytechnical pub public address and all these devices are connected to this router so these two raspberry pis are obviously fixed and shared components these two only these two and obviously, the Philips U hub is shared and fixed in the lab. That means that for using 
Philips U lab lamps, you have to be in La Vispe because this object is the one that manages and creates the network, the wireless network, in which the Philips U lamps work. So this is important. If you plan to use Philips U lamps, you have to be in La Vispe to test your work. So, and this is in a closed space in the second room of La Dispe. Then, well, the Philips U bridge has an IP address that you can obviously use for connecting to the, the hub and this Raspberry here with the Z-Wave module has obviously another uh, private uh, IP address and a web interface. It also publish a web interface to manage Z-Wave device. Next Thursday, here, I will bring this here in the classroom with some lamps and some devices, and we will try to use two software, two scripts in Python that are already published on GitHub and linked on the website here in the next Thursday lecture, code for Philips U and code for Z-Wave device. So we try to use that software to control some lights and to control some Z-Wave device. They use, the way of working is quite similar. Both of them expose some HTTP REST API. So you just have to call that API to have the list of devices, for example, to, uh, to control, to turn on a lamp, to turn on a, um, a plug from the other uh, device, the controller, to sense, to get this, the temperature measured in the room from the Z-Wave part and so on. So both of them expose some RESTful API. This Philips U bridge from the that address and the other one from this other address, IP address. So those two IP address are important for connecting with that. Then they have different way of working uh, for how it's, it works the network. So this, the Philips U, is a ZigBee network and require that for each new application that try to connect to the hub, there is someone that push, physically push the button on the hub. Otherwise, you cannot be control anything. The other object instead just require the username and the password hmm, to be sent in the code. So it's two different way of working. We will try here next week, both of them. Hmm. But after that point, the way of using Philips U bridge on the other and the other device is similar. They expose HTTP requests, so you have to do a get to get some information, a post to modify something, both here and there. So the scripts, the Python program from both of these devices, from both of these examples, are really, really similar because they just need to perform some HTTP request. So, for the Philips U, we have at least six lamp, lamps, hmm? traditional lamps, and uh, if the Ladispe technician try, found it, also a very long, three meters, five meters, lead strip. So, a long strip of LEDs that can be controlled like the lamps. How can you do with this thing? Well, obviously, turn on and off. Then you can also change the color, the intensity of the color, and so on. And they also have some effects. So, for example, they have a color loop effect for which they start changing color continuously up to someone say, please stop. So they have some effects. 
both of them the six plus more than six lamps and these very long lead strips i told you that the bridge is fixed in the lab and that you need to be there to use this however there is for the philips u lamp a software emulator that, allow, that is a Java program that you install on your computer and then probably I am. Where? I don't know. This one. It's just this. A window in which you have some messages here <clears throat> you have to start the emulator and then you have some picture here of the hub and some lamps you can add how many lamps do you want and you can perform most of the operation that you perform on real lamps here and see if it works and you here in this black area you can also see um, the messages that you sent to the bridge, to the emulated bridge, and the responses that the bridge sent back to you. So this could be an option for start prototyping, for start testing something at home with Philips U instead of being physically in the lab. For just for any reason, the lab is closed, you are not you're, you cannot go there or something like that. So for the Philips U there is this emulator that is downloadable from this the link included in in the slides and it works like 99% like I will show you next time what is this 1% difference uh, from the real physical bridge and land. So for now they are really really close uh, except one technical difference uh, the other difference for this emulator and that it cannot show, for example, the color loop effect. So you can see a lamp that change color, that turn on and off, but the color loops, so lamps that continuously change color, is not shown on the emulator, but it's accepted as a command, and so it does not give you any error if you try to perform these effects on the emulator. Then we have this Z-Wave device. So, first of all, the, uh, the Philips U, I told you, has this bridge that create and manage a ZigBee network, uh, more precise, precisely a ZigBee Smart Lightning network, that, as the word says, for lights only. This, instead, is a module only for Raspberry Pis. So, this is a module that you have to put on the Raspberry Pi. One of these with the Raspberry Pi is in the lab, but we also have other, at least other three of these um, boards. So we can, you can borrow this either from the lab or for me, from me. And if you have a Raspberry, you can put it on your Raspberry and work at home with this type of devices. The, this controller, create and manage the Z-Wave network and it has a software that is called Z-Way that allow you to expose uh, an HTTP or REST API that allow you to control and manage and whatever the, all the Z-Wave devices. So, as I told you, one of these is on the development bench, the other are just free, so you can borrow it. So, all of this material, except the one in the development bench, can be borrowed by you. So you can take this material home. So no need to be there or to be at Ladispe to work for your project. You just have to ask the Ladispe technician to borrow this. They just write down your name and which material do you take. Some of this material, for example, one of these is in my office because it's not, uh, it's always polytechnic material, but it's not LADISP material. So it's physically in my office, but it's the same procedure. So, but again, most of these 
with the exception of these and some Z-Wave device are in La Dispe. Then that controller allow you to, well, control and use a series of devices. What we have? We have some of these plugs that are on-off plugs. So you put something here and then you can remotely control on and off whatever is attached to. You can also press this button to physically turn on and off things. Most of them are metered in the meaning that they store and sense how many energy, electrical energy and power is connected through the plug. And some of them, just one or two, are dimmable. So you can control how many current is available to the connected device. So if you connect a lamp and you press this, the lamp becomes always more and more uh, brighter. So it changes luminosity. Then we have some multi-sensor, four in one. One of these is, uh, three of these are in La Dispe, and one of these is in La Dispe, near the development branch, bench. These four in one sensors are sensors that give you luminosity, looks, humidity of a room, temperature of a room, and motion, like the devices that are in the bathroom, in the, yeah, in the bathroom. So just sense if there is someone that is waving his hand here and say, yes, some, something is moving. Then we have just one door window sensor. The door window sensor is uh, it's composed by two pieces. Uh, one stay on the moving part of the door and the other one on the fixed part of the door and they sense if the door of the windows is just open or closed. And then we have two brand new six-in-one multi-sensor that are the evolution of the previous one that give you luminosity, humidity, temperature, motion like before, but also have a vibration, sense if it vibrates, and some UV sensor. They are the evolution of the other device. This cover the, we can say, home automation part, both for lights with Philips Hue and for all these other things with Z-Wave. Then in La Dispe, and this is the other things that you cannot move, we have this wall in the second room that is another home automation system from Bitticino that is um, uh, use a technology that's called My Home and the protocol that is called Open WebNet. And it has some object to be controlled. Uh, typically, uh, most of when it's used, it's used for this uh, element here, that one, uh, that is a blind. So it go ups and down, and you can stop it and say, please go up, please go down, or stop in any position that you like. So this is another object if you need to simulate a shutter that is closing, a tent, or something like that. This, however, is fixed, obviously. You cannot move all this wall. Then we have these four fitness tracker, two of them with heart rate measurement. In particular, the Fitbit charge is, if you need heart rate measurement, you have to use the Fitbit, the Fitbit charge because the other one doesn't have uh, APIs to get that measure. Instead of Fitbit, yes, it has. So if you need to get data from heart rate, you have just to use the Fitbit charge. The other two are useful for, I don't know, how many steps do you 
uh, did today or something like that. All of these, again, are in LADISPE. Then we have, and you can borrow this, again, more than 10 Raspberry Pis with cases, power adapter, SD cards, whatever. Well, the Raspberry modules, that is that Z-Wave modules that I told you before. More than 10 Arduino Yun that are Arduino with Wi-Fi uh, embedded, if needed, and also other version of Arduino uh, in LADISPE. These Arduino Yun, uh, Yun are the, uh, just arrived last week, so they are really, really new and never used before. Uh, do you know the difference between an Arduino, the main difference between an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi? No. No one? So basically, a Raspberry Pi is a computer. It's a, a real computer. So you have USB port, you have Ethernet, in the most recent model, you have Bluetooth, you have Wi-Fi, you have an operating system, a real operating system. On a Raspberry Pi, it runs uh, Linux. Typically, it runs Linux, um, a version of Debian. But there is also a Windows 10 version for Raspberry Pi, for the, the, the Intrepid, and so, but basically, it's a computer that has an HDMI port, so you can connect a mouse, a keyboard, a monitor, and it has a desktop, and you can open a web browser and navigate on the internet. You can program on it with a, an IDE if you want. Maybe a little bit slow for doing this, but it's a real computer. <coughs> it has the, a, a microprocessor similar to the one that is in your smartphone. So it's a computer, it's just a computer. Hmm? The Raspberry Pi. The Arduino is a microcontroller. It's not a computer. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not a, a real computer in the sense of a laptop or a desktop computer. It is not an operating system, a real full edge operating system. Hmm? It doesn't run with Linux or Windows. So Arduino, is more for connecting things, uh, electrical things, resistor, capacitors, and something like that, and build something. Raspberry Pi is more limited on this. You can do something, really, really small things with Raspberry Pi. You can connect a Raspberry Pi with an Arduino to do more uh, things in the, you can say, uh, like a, an electronic engineer, you can say, let me say this. And or electrotechnics. So you can just make something with Arduino. Instead in the Raspberry, it's just more a, a computer, a mini computer, let me say. So this is the main difference. Another way of saying this is that the Arduino do typically one thing very well, and the Raspberry Pi is able to do how many things do you want? Because it's more similar, it's more general purpose like a computer. But it has the latest version of the Raspberry Pi as a quad-core uh, processor, one or two giga gigabytes of RAMs, uh, and so something like that. So it's quite powerful, the latest version of the, the Raspberry Pi. Bluetooth 4.1, Wi-Fi, and Ethernet, and whatever. The, the Arduino is way more limited in that sense for creating things from the other side, Arduino is more versatile and suitable than the Raspberry. It just, it's more a board for a microcontroller, the Arduino. So this is the main difference. So if you want to run a web server for Raspberry, it's a yes, and for Arduino, it's no. If you want to run Python on Raspberry, yes, on Arduino, forget it. If you want to run Java, again, Raspberry, yes, Arduino, no. If you want to create a dedicated model in C 
to do one thing very well, please use Arduino. So this is say, the main difference. Then we have, again, brand new two smartwatches with Wear OS by Google. And uh, uh, quite a lot of Bluetooth beacon. In particular, we have nine beacons estimate, this one, bigger one, and 10 of this sticker. The difference uh, is that this, this one, the, the normal beacon, uh, all of them are estimate as a brand. All of them are Bluetooth. So they are used to sense or to recognize you at distance or to do something. So you have maybe um, a mobile application and when you go near to one of these, it, you, the mobile application will show you something different than when you go near to this other one. So each of them is a separate point in the room, in the space. And you can have different behavior associated with one of that in the most advanced case. So we have nine of these bigger, more range, several meters, more battery, bigger, a little bit bigger, I don't know, five, six centimeters. And 10 of these that are thicker because the idea of this the idea of this one, the bigger one, is to put it on a wall and let people go around. The idea of the sticker is to put it on the object. So on each sticker, there is, for example, a, an image, a show, um, a bike, a fridge, because the idea is to put this on devices, on objects, on your smartphone, on your case, on your door and so on and use it. All of these are Bluetooth. Then we have some other uh, sensors like for example proximity sensor, ultrasound that works with Raspberry Pis and Arduinos. We have a force sensitive sensor that is this one. So you can sense if you press it. Some load cell scale, basically small scale. And then all of them to be borrowed. And then some spare hardware if you want to experiment with Arduino, like breadboard, LEDs, uh, resistor, capacitors, and so on. A, a lot of them. I cannot list all of these because they are only a display from decades. So there are really a lot of them. Then, since you may want to use uh, some USB similar device on your computer or on a Raspberry Pi, we also have USB Bluetooth adapter because the model of Raspberry Pi that we have has not with a uh, Bluetooth incorporated, and also a Wi-Fi adapter for Raspberry Pi, typically for Raspberry Pi, but you can also use on a normal uh, computer. Then a 2.8 inches touchscreen LCD, again, typically to be put on the Raspberry Pi. Some microphones, if you just need to get some audio. Again, they work also with Raspberry Pi. They are not dedicated to Raspberry Pis, but they work with Raspberry Pis. Some webcams, just normal webcams, USB. Well, uh, power banks, if you need some power on the go. And some act active speaker. So a traditional speaker with cable, with a jack. And also two Bluetooth speaker. Just if you need to stream some voice or stream some music in the normal speaker, or with this Bluetooth one. Yes, then we have um, some RFID, RFID NFC tags in various format, key fob, sticker, cards, bracelet, all the same things, just the package change. And we have, um, let me say, totally useless 
a mini thermal printer that is a small printer that prints using thermal um, energy so it's I don't know and uh, we have a, uh, it's there uh, if you need to print something really really small in a really really fashion way you can use it and uh, um, two of these are Duino Braccio that are to be built and they are just for Arduino so you can put Arduino here in this small robot it's more or less this size the size that you see here more or less and you can just move this robotic arm and I don't know it's there we have two of them if you want or if you need it to pick something or to uh, maintain something and move this object around we have two of them never used before so this is the first part an overview of which hardware you can use so basically let me say that you have some home automation smart devices so the Philips U for lighting lamps or the LED strip Z-Wave for sensing an environment for sensing object how many power they consume um, or plugs hmm, to turn on off things uh, brutally and then we have some hardware hmm, Raspberry Pis other board for um, for Raspberry Pi for for example creating a Z-Wave network at, at home to, so the home automation part the smart device part then we have some smart watches fitness bracelet to be put on the person also the smart watches as a heart rate sensor so this is another uh, source of heart rate uh, capacity of the person and some hardware Arduino related or Raspberry related like a scale, a pressure sensor, a ultrasound sensor to sense how an object is filled for example and so on then we are trying to get a Roomba for one group right and that is not here because it's not our so all of this with accept of the things that I told you that is that are fixed or shared in Ladispe are again can be borrowed by you hmm? starting from next month this Monday the Monday that is coming hmm? so that you can work also at home or whatever you want and this goes the first part for the second part that is linked here here you see in the lecture of today yes that we have a list of av available material that are these lights and this what can I use for this what can I use for is just this Google Doc document so I just wrote here six different things so what can I use for uh, trying to remember your projects on last Monday so for example what can I use for detecting people in a space in a room or what can I use for locating people outside in the open space or for notifying a user or for understanding how much something is filled up you can put some again still something or it's filled it's full it's a full bin for example and how can you what can you use for getting input from a user or for for example turning objects on and off so there are just six tables here so let's try to 
to reason, to think about how can we populate this. I would like to do this maybe together. And then if we done doesn't finish here, I will fill up that so that you can at home, so that maybe not at home tomorrow, and uh, um, so that you can have this online just for reference or for, for future use. And then if speaking with gr some groups, we you have some other specific needs, we can just add it to this table so that every group can see how can approach a specific problem. So, for example, what can we use from that list to detect people in a space, in a room? Idea. So, motion sensor, right? That is motion sensor. Then, Bluetooth beacon. Then at least another thing so you can use. People. Detecting people. In a room. No. Motion is there. But why not a near field? Because you have to, to pass through near something. So maybe it's how can we detect that is a, a person is near, close to an object. We can, for example, use that one. But this it's how to detect that in this room there is someone. Camera. Camera. So, and from that list, what can we use here? So, for example, for the motion sensor, we can use the four in one, uh, the Z wave, four in one, or the six in one uh, sensor. So, but what are the features of this sensor? So, how can how can it detect people in the room? It detects really for real people or just if the text is something is moving in the room so okay so it can be used for detecting people obviously but this at this limitation that it detects if something is moving so if you have a people lying uh, on a desk uh, sleeping this is useless but depends what you need if you need to, to detect if someone is moving on a specific spot, moving through a specific spot, this could be a very good idea. If you need to detect if there is a specific person anywhere in the room, even if it's sleeping, probably this is not a good choice. So, but let's write this here. If uh, it detects, if uh, something is moving, or not. Weather. It just detect movement. Hmm? Then beacon. Like before, the specific device and then a description what we can do with this beacon for detecting people in the space. So the device is the estimate beacons, probably the bigger one. And it also has a website. Let's write here. Maybe it's, it's HTTPS. So I... I Two ways of exploiting this beacon came to my mind for detecting people. The power of the signal, yes. So let's write, you can exploit the Bluetooth 
strength signal uh, between uh, yes. between uh, a smartphone computer and uh, one or more beacons and also in this case you have two possible scenarios you have a beacon on a wall and the person with a smartphone for example or a computer that is moving around so you perform the detection on your computer or your smartphone and the beacon is fixed on the wall so you are moving with your device so for example if you plan to use a smartphone this is a good scenario but also the opposite can be used so you have, let me say, a Raspberry Pi somewhere fixed in a room with a Bluetooth adapter and you carry out the beacon. And so it's the Raspberry that tracks you because you have the beacon with you. So you are moving as the beacon that is moving. What are the difference, the main difference? That in the first case, the beacon is stuck there and you have maybe a mobile application you have to create a mobile application to do this in the other case you just have the beacon and maybe you have a python program running on the raspberry pi and so the calculation are performed in the first case on your smartphone for example because it's maybe not really realistic that you carry around your project a computer a laptop and in the other case, the computation is made on the fixed object that is the Raspberry Pi. They are equivalent for the final results, but they are different for the things that you need to do for realizing the project. In the first case, maybe it's working with Android or iOS or something like that. In the second case, it's maybe just a Python script in a Raspberry Pi. So different uh, difficulties and different output outcomes and then if you really want the second things you so that one that your colleagues a colleague told us is just the bluetooth strength signal so everything that has bluetooth as a strength signal you are not exploiting nothing particular of beacons just they are small and portable as devices but the Bluetooth beacon is also a protocol that for uh, that for there is two version the say of the beacon protocol let me say one is by Apple it is called iBeacon and the other is by Google it is called Ediston they do more or less the same things and the estimate beacons support both of them so you can also exploit something more specific something more uh, advanced by exploiting this protocol. However, while the strength signal of the Bluetooth of Bluetooth is quite trivial to get because every Bluetooth object can have a signal, a strength signal, the other case requires you to use the SDK of Estimote that is available for mobile application only. So it's again a, a trade-off between what you need. Maybe the strength signal is more than enough for your project or maybe you want more specific feature so but it's it's an option or uh, you can leverage uh, the estimate mobile sdk for uh, for nothing for more advanced applications and then we have the camera. Again, well, which device a uh, generic webcam is, is okay. And what can you do? Okay, so um, you can recognize people by faces. You can also uh, 
Yes, well, it's, it's, it's not related to the camera. It's something that you do after. So you can recognize single, recognize people by faces. So you are different than this other one. So we would like to know if person A is in the room. We can do this with webcam. We can do this probably with beacon, if every person has a different beacon. We cannot do this with the motion sensor. Obviously, this is more uh, intrusive, less privacy, let me say. And what, what is another we can say, problem of this? Is that the camera, you need to put the camera in a specific position in the room that cover hopefully all the room, but difficultly. So you only see a portion of the room, if the room is big enough. But maybe it's, it's just okay. So you can recognize people by faces. You can also track people movement more easily than with Beacon, probably, because you just track people. You are not interested in who is these people. You are not interested in recognizing people, but just track if some people are moving in the room. Um, or, for example, count them, and so on. To count all the people with the, a black t-shirt. You can do with this with the camera, you cannot do this with the Bluetooth beacon or with the motion sensor. You, with the camera, you don't need to give anything to a person to track it, to track them. If you want to count person, you just have a webcam and a piece of software and count how many people are in the room in the area that is seen by the camera. In this other case, you have to give a beacon for each person to reach the same result. And how can you do this? This, let me say, quite advanced feature. Not for, from scratch, obviously, but you have to exploit, uh, for example, computer vision libraries. libraries such as such as OpenSV hmm? so OpenCV is the de facto open source library for computer vision hmm? and it's available in a lot of programming language including Python for example so if you go on the OpenCV website, that is opencv.org, and you go on, for example, online documentation or tutorial, you see, for example, the Python, that are the same, the Python uh, tutorials. So for example, in object detection, you have a yes, the explanation of how it works, and then the code for detecting faces and other features inside the face with just 10 rows of code. And if this is not a still image, but a video, a stream, a series of images that are put together, that is a video by definition, you can also track people, and you can also count how many blue rectangles are here. So you can do all of this with just a webcam and 10 line of code, and probably some errors in this counting procedure for imprecision. But there is really a, a lot of things uh, for OpenCV and Python and a lot of documentation on the internet. But just, just a preview. Instead, for motion sensor, 
for software part, uh, you can use the, the project that is already on GitHub that we will see next week for Z-Wave network and for the Bluetooth beacon we are planning to publish a really simple Python script to get the signal stream, the strength of a signal of any Bluetooth object, in particular the beacon, so that you can have some starting point in all of these three uh, options. Uh, the Estimote SDK is obviously available online on the Estimote website, so we cannot provide you with just a lot of things. Then, let's move to locating people outside. What can we use? GPS. GPS. Let me add and related technologies like uh, cellular for smartphone, geolocalization, something like that. Then So, GPS is more pervasive and can detect people outside everywhere. If you imagine to move outside but near some buildings and to detect people near some buildings, you can also use at least other three things, two of them in the, in the previous table. Camera. Bluetooth beacons. Beacons. And finally, outside, you will get everything. From a windy day, it's, it's a mess, you know? Motion sensor is terrible inside. Something that is not in the previous table, but that all of you with a laptop open are using now, probably. If you have Wi-Fi connection. Wi connection, yeah. So, GPS. How can you use GPS and similar technologies? So, two cases comes to my mind. In the background, so while the person is doing other things, in your projects, obviously, with, um, let me say, a handmade mobile application. So you can realize a mobile application that get GPS data when you need and then commute perform some operation with that. Or in the foreground, in uh, explicitly, let me say, so I, want, I would like to know where you are now. I don't want to track you in some moment, but when you open something on your computer or on your smartphone without installing a mobile application, I would like to know where you are. So how can, for example, we can do this? Ne did you never go on a website and the web browser ask you, the website would like to know your location? Yes, no. Never happened? In this way, the geolocation, geolocalization. So, in web technologies, using web technologies, using JavaScript, and maybe some API from Google Maps, you can quite easily get the location of the people, of a person, when it opens a web browser on your website. So it's explicitly, because he have to open the web browser and navigate to a specific page, but maybe it's, it's okay for your project because you need the location in that specific moment. I, I was thinking, for example, of, uh, uh, let me say, an uh, alerting system. So I want to send an alert and transmit my position only when there is a, a warning, a danger. So I can open something and press a button or open this website and this page 
and automatically send my position with this alerting. I don't really want maybe to track the person all over the day, just in that moment. So explicitly um, with geolocalization. Uh, the, 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 the advantage of this is that it works with web browser. You can have geolocalization on your mobile phone with a mobile app or also in every browser, almost every browser. So laptop, Raspberry Pi, or uh, a smartphone that opens a web page. Any smartphone that opens a web page. Webcam, webcam like before. Let me just copy and paste the exploiting computer vision library. So the difference between the first and the second is that here with GPS you just could be everywhere. And but you have to possess a device that is GPS capable. Otherwise you don't have the GPS. In, in these other cases, in this case, you need to be in the range of the webcam, of the camera, so near some buildings maybe, and the camera is seeing everything, so it can, like before, detect people, move the track, the movement of people, and so on. Similarly, in the Bluetooth beacon, the same things as before, You just have, you need to have a beacon in the building, outside a building, or a Bluetooth emitter in the building, and something, a beacon in, in your hand, and like before, just you're moving outside instead of in, in, inside a room. And again, you need to have something with you, the beacon, or a computer, or whatever. Wi-Fi. How can you detect people with Wi-Fi? So there is the equivalent of Bluetooth, the, signal, the, the strength of the signal. Okay, it's easier with Bluetooth. Um, but there is another way. Hmm. Can you explain better? Yes. Yes. Easier than that. So, okay, this is one option. So you have access, you need to have access in this case to the router, let me say, or to more complex infrastructure. So if you imagine here in Polytechnical, Polytechnical, no, uh, all of you, you are connecting to the Polito or Edurome uh, network with your matricula with your student ID. So Polytechnic will know that you are near to a certain access point that is the nearest one here, then it doesn't store all this information for privacy purposes and so on, but it are a more complex infrastructure than just looking in the access point. Because for example, with EduRom, you can use your credential to log in in a university in Spain that uses the same EduRom network. So it's just more complex than, than just looking in a, in a router. But yes, if you can access that data, for example, in a router, you can get how many devices are there. The problem, yes, that you, the problem is one, that you have to be able to access to the router. And the second problem is that typically uh, there is a list time quite long. So you appear on a router and then you remain on a router for some time, if, even if you turned off your Wi-Fi. But this is an option. Another option that you may see, so that doesn't require access to the router. Just require a little bit of knowledge and a device with Wi-Fi enabled. So right now you are connected to the Wi-Fi, right? To which network? are connected. 
Polito e Rom e Rom. At home, in which network you are connected? At Rom? No, another network. Or yes, uh, if you live here. So every device, every user can say, okay, when I connect to the Edurom network, I'm nearby the Polytechnico. When I connect to my X network, I'm near home. When I see, because if you open your Wi-Fi network uh, settings or on the smartphone or a computer, you see a list of networks. So you can say, okay, when I see this list of network, a subset of this, I'm, he, I'm more or less in this position. You can do this programmatically. From a computer, from a mobile application, uh, you cannot do this with web application for now, but you can do this. So this could be another way. So when I see, if I'm interested in knowing, for example, if I am near home, because I need to, to have this information, inside or near home, I can exploit Wi-Fi. Just to say, if I see the Wi-Fi network of my home, so I'm there, I'm near home. If I'm not seeing this Wi-Fi network, probably I am every, in, in any other place in the world, but not near my home. So this is a different level of uh, sophistication, but it's something that you can use for understand if you are outside and near some specific place. So for example, your home, your uh, the, the Politecnico or something, a restaurant that has Wi-Fi or something like that. Some specific spot, you can get all these in this way, for example. So let me say by exploiting uh, um, visible connected connected Wi-Fi network. Hmm? Or if you have access to a router, you can get the list of connected devices and see if the device of your interest is in that, that list. Two options. One require the access to the router, the other one is more personal, let me say. Good. Let's do another one. Choose notify user, understanding how much is filled up. Ah. Uh, getting input or turning object. What do you want to do? One of that. Two here are saying getting input. Anybody else? Turning objects are enough? Yes, let's do this. So, please. How can we turn objects on and off? Yeah, obviously. Smart plug. Or, I just... Just that we don't have a button. A uh, robotic arm pushing the button on, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an option. Scar, sorry? Yeah, with Arduino, with the brush or whatever. So with SmartPug, it's the easiest. Uh, the other, I, I wasn't able to think other than this two. As which? Yes, let me put here, here. Because also the smart plug is a switch in a sense. So you, you are then a switch a button on the, on the wall or a switch a. No, switch a uh, Yeah, so let me put it near the. Sorry? Yes, yes. Um, it's a thing, it's an object. So um, Philips U. So. 
Let's start from the Philips Hue. Philips Hue, you can turn on off some lamps. Just the lamps, the easiest one. From the other two, smart plugs are the easiest. So, why? Because you just plug it something and then you just cut the power and the things go off and uh, you maybe restore the power and depends of the object is connected and it go on. So for example, for a um, fan, a room, a fan for the summer, you can leave that on and connect to a plug and then when you don't need it, just turn off the plug and the fan, because it's a quite stupid device, just turn off and then if you give power again, the fan start rotating and moving the hair. So smart plug are just the easiest option for any, let me say stupid device, in the meaning that if you uh, connect to a smart plug a uh, coffee machine, you just, you can turn off the coffee machine, you can turn on the coffee machine, but you don't get coffee, basically, because you cannot control the process. You're just allowed to allow something, allow that someone can make a coffee by giving power and by turning off the plug, you just prevent that someone can use the device. So for the smart plug, we have these Z-Wave plugs. For the Arduino, you can do whatever you want. You can use a switch, just give, connect some, maybe you have to turn on and off a, a, a LED, so you just connect a LED and you just control one or more LED. So for example, controlling, control an LED with Arduino, some, and so on. So let me say, or by connecting a switch to, for example, Arduino to have some logic in the operation that you are performing, or just control something that is driven by the Arduino. But again, three different cases. Second one for lamps, the third one for lamps, just for lamps. The first one just turn allow to use something or stop using something that in some cases is equal to turning off and on things and the second one is more uh, precise but probably if you have to turn on a fan it's better to use a smart plug because it's easier it's quicker and so on while if you want to control a switch more precisely in, in certain moment or control some a strip of LEDs custom made, not the Philips Hue strips and other, you can, for example, use Arduino to just control small load, for example. So then I will continue to, to fill up this up. Um, so for example, let, let's write only this first column here for you now getting input. Yeah, just the, the second option. Just this column here from getting input. So how we can get input from user? Microphone. Perfect. Then Bluetooth. No, let's say uh, explicit input. So it's someone that want to give explicitly an input to do something. So like a microphone because you speak or for example a touch screen be they be, be it on a smartphone or the, the touch screen for the Raspberry Pi that we have so something that you touch 
Or, for example, it's not explicit. Well, it depends. Let's say um, gesture. Let's say camera is not a device. That is, with camera, you can do some movement, like the Kinect, for example. So you can perform some gesture in front of a camera. And so you are get input. Uh, this is difficult with a normal camera, but it's, it's an option. And, and then it, it, one, you miss one thing, one obvious thing. Keyboard, keyboard yes, typing. And keyboard could be typing in something or just, for example, send a message. You can type a message into a Telegram bot and perform some option, some operation. Keyboard, for example. Any other idea? I don't think so. Okay, so for my own work, I will fill up these other two tables. And uh, now, in this half an hour, no, 15 minutes, uh, if some groups want, would like to speak about component selection and this type of process for their project, only, not in general. You can, I'm just here for this remaining 15 minutes, so we can speak if you have any doubts about your project with respect to component selection or what can you use for something, okay? Then on Monday with Professor Corno, you will do something, let me say similar to this lecture, but not equal, obviously, but about the architecture of the project. So not something related to single component or single subsystem or needs, but in a more general multi-components, how they speak each other and so on. Okay, so I will stop here the registration and if you have any question or doubts, just I'm still here. <laughs>